morning here for, for worship. It's really good to have folks uh, joining us online as well. So you're most welcome if you're watching um, at home uh, or indeed later on. Um, and we have a special welcome today uh, to uh, a family, special guest, uh, who will hopefully no longer feel like a guest very soon. Um, so we've got Stephen Woods. Stephen uh, is going to be our student assistant for the next number of years. Uh, Stephen's wife is Rachel, um, who was in my youth fellowship in White Abbey days. Does that scare me or what? Maybe it scares her. Uh, and their wee boy, Judah. Um, who is here with his toy tractors and all that kind of stuff, which is great. Um, and I don't mind me maybe mentioning Granny McNair is here as well, so it's great to have you. You're very welcome too. Uh, so it's great to have uh, the whole family uh, with us today, and Stephen will be taking part uh, later in the service. Um, as usual, Crash is available during the service. Uh, Promised Land, of course, the boys and girls will go to Promised Land uh, at the appropriate time during the service uh, as well. Uh, we'll be serving communion later on uh, in the service too, uh, using our, our little uh, pods uh, for that. So hopefully you have one available in your pew. If you don't, uh, just kind of let uh, one of our uh, welcome team know and they'll find you one. There's probably one in the pew in front of you or something like that. Um, and after the service, do stay around for a bit of chit chat. We don't have tea and coffee this morning, but if you want to sign up for next week or the week after, uh, that would be uh, really good. Uh, today, uh, we have a praise picnic in the park. Uh, the three churches in the village have come together. Uh, we're meeting at four o'clock. Uh, we're having a picnic together. Bring your rugs, bring your chairs. Um, you'll not need, uh, you know, it'll be sunny. You'll, you'll not need anything else. Um, Put on your suntan cream, you know, um, and uh, we'll provide you with burgers and sausages. Uh, but if you have other things you want to bring, drinks and other bits and bobs to make it into a bit more of a picnic, then uh, bring some uh, things with you. Uh, so that kicks off around four, and we'd love to have as many people as there uh, as possible. I was actually walking the dog over there this morning. I just thought, wouldn't it be class to have this park ringing with the praises of King Jesus uh, this afternoon? as we celebrate the Platinum Jubilee, yes, but doing so with praise uh, to our Lord. So wouldn't it be great to have our village ringing with those praises this afternoon? So love to see you uh, there for that. Um, through the week, there's various activities as usual, of course. Uh, Wednesday at 7 is our prayer time. Um, and uh, we, we actually met during the week to organize our Holiday Bible Club. So the dates of that are Tuesday the 23rd through to Thursday the 25th of August. Uh, so it's a three-day Holiday Bible Club uh, towards the end of August. Uh, our next team meeting is Wednesday the 15th of June in the evening at half seven. So if you can help with that, uh, we'd love you uh, to do so. Um, just a couple of other things. One is that we have a family fun night coming up on Friday the 17th of June. So Friday week. Um, and lots of kind of mad activities in the car park there. So if you enjoyed yesterday's afternoon, which we had a great time here in the community association uh, with all their activities, uh, then there's assault courses, team games, a tractor pull, a barbecue, and so on in a couple of weeks' time as well. Great way to bring others in and bring people together and make connections. So uh, that's in a couple of weeks' uh, time. And just one more thing is to thank you from Karen and myself uh, uh, for your sponsorship of our Christian Aid Step Challenge uh, 300,000 steps in May. It sounds like a lot, but we managed it all right. We, we, we kind of hit above it, which was nice. Uh, but more importantly, uh, we raised uh, 780 pounds plus gift aid um, for Christian Aid. So really thank you to you uh, for your support of that. You can continue to support Christian Aid to today. So if you still want to give to Christian Aid through our envelopes, there probably are still a few available. Or if you want to speak to Julie, our Christian Aid rep, uh, you can do that. And then our own church collection for that will close. Uh, at the end of today as well. Those are all our announcements. I've already mentioned that today uh, on this weekend we're, we're celebrating uh, the Platinum Jubilee. The Queen Elizabeth II became Queen on the 6th of February 1952. Uh, her coronation uh, was about a year and a half later uh, in June of 1953, the 2nd of June. And in that coronation service she was presented with an orb that you can just about hold in your hand of 600 jewels and pearls, with a cross on the top of it symbolizing the rule of Jesus Christ, that she is becoming queen, but she is a servant of a greater king. And she was told in the service, remember that the whole world is subject to the power and empire of Christ our Redeemer. 
And so that reminds me of a verse in Revelation that we would have read a number of weeks ago where we started in Revelation 1 back at the start of May. We're going to close in Revelation 21 and 22 today. Uh, but verse 6 of the first chapter says, Jesus Christ is the ruler of the kings of the earth. It's him we come before today. It's him that we ultimately praise. And we do so in our opening hymn. It's all hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall. And let's crown him, crown him, crown him, Lord of all. So let's stand and bring him praise and worship together. In our opening prayer, we're going to praise uh, King Jesus using some words from the book of, of Revelation. Uh, we will also, because of the occasion, uh, bring our thanks to God uh, for our Queen and pray for her. Being a Christian does not necessarily mean you are a royalist, but the scriptures do call us to pray for all of those who are in authority over us. And we will do that in our prayers, and we will close them using the words of the Lord's Prayer that asks that God's kingdom come here on earth. So let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we bow before you this morning. It's a time of great joy to come before you and bring you our praises and our worship that you alone are the King of Kings. You are the Lord of Lords. You're the God over all the nations. We bow before you, praise you, and worship you. We crown you Lord of all. And we remind ourselves, Lord, that your word tells us the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah. And he will reign forever and ever. Lord, we acknowledge that kings and queens and other earthly rulers come and go. But Lord, you have always reigned and you always will reign as king and Lord over all things. So we bow in praise before you. Your word also reminds us, great and marvelous are your deeds, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, King of the nations. Who will not fear you, Lord, and bring glory to your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship before you. 
for your righteous acts have been revealed. Lord, we praise you that your greatest righteous act was for you, Lord Jesus, to lay down your life for us on the cross for our sin so that we could come into your kingdom and you rose from the dead, defeating death, so we have the hope of being in your kingdom, not just now, but forever and ever. Lord, we bow before you today uh, to give you thanks for 70 years of Queen Elizabeth's reign. We thank you for her faith in you. And we want to pray for her and for all who lead, not just in our nation here, but in all nations across the world, whether they are kings or queens, whether they are prime ministers or presidents, whether they are members of parliament or local assembly. Lord, to lead is a challenging call. And we want to pray for your help, your wisdom, your strength and direction, your integrity, your justice, your righteousness, your grace, your gentleness, your kindness for all who lead over us. May your kingdom come, we pray. Lord, we bring all our prayers to you in the words that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Boys and girls, uh, it's good to have you in church uh, today. Would you like to come down to the front? We'll have a wee chat together. Probably if you're sitting at the front, if you're kind of more over this side, that might make life a little bit easier. Uh, we're quite uh, crowded down the front, but come on down, we'll have a chat together. Coming on down, good stuff. Great to see you, honestly, really good. You can, you can come and sit here if you want, or if you want to sit in the pew behind, you can, but you're allowed to sit on the carpet on the floor, on the floor if you want, whatever you want to do, brilliant. Great stuff, good to see you. Give me a fist pump that we're here, good. It's nice to make a bit of connection again after all this stuff, hasn't it? Good, good. Oh, I've got a fist pump at the far end. Great job, who have I missed? Fist pump there, fist pump there. This pump there, good job. Now, who was anybody at any celebrations this last wee while? Anybody at the the the, the village fair yesterday? Anybody at the village fair yesterday? Yeah, put your hand up if you were there. The duck race, yeah. Anybody um, on the bouncy castle kind of stuff? Yeah, okay. Did you have a good time? Yeah, okay. So we were celebrating something. What? And maybe you did this in school as well. Did you have a party in school? Anybody put your hand up if you had a party in school or, or playgroup or whatever? Yeah, okay. So what were you having parties for? Why were we having a big village mad crazy day yesterday? Any ideas? What's it all to do with? Yeah. The Queen's Jubilee. So we'll put it up. How, how, how many years has the Queen been on the throne? Do we know? 70. So let's see a picture of her just in case you've forgotten what she looks like. Okay. Do you think she looks happy? Yeah. Here, did you see her last night? This isn't in my script. Did you see her last night with Paddington? Wasn't that magnificent? If you haven't seen the Queen with Paddington, okay, ask mum or dad or whoever looks after you to get onto the BBC iPlayer and go and find the Queen with Paddington because I'll tell you, it's the best bit of TV you'll ever see. Okay, right. So, great job. And did you see all the crowds? We've got a picture of the crowds down the mall, okay? Uh, somebody from our congregation was in London very recently, but I don't think she's in that picture because uh, she's back here. But anyway, so lots of crowds all there celebrating, waving their flags and having a great big party and all of that uh, for the Queen. And do you know what I found? Or not I say found. What I got given and shown was a picture of Ballynure having a big street party way back in 1953 and this 
It's very confusing. So she came to the throne in 1952, which is why it's 70 years, but she didn't have her big service for coronation until 1953 because it took them 14 months to plan it. There you are. That's what happens. So, but there you are. So that was Ballyneur nearly 70 years ago. And we think there's a couple of people in that picture who I think one of them's actually here today, but we better not get into it. So, yeah. So a special prize if you can find the person. <laughs> but it's not quite something. So, the, you know, the street parties and all of that, that happens quite a lot, actually, for a queen becoming queen, and then maybe 10 years in or 25 years in or 60 years in or 70 years. That's what we've had uh, over this weekend as well. Now, the queen's a very interesting lady because she speaks to the nation quite a lot. And on Christmas Day, you maybe don't tend to watch this, but you might find that somebody in your house watches this. Where the queen speaks to us and tells us what she's thinking about things. And in her Christmas message, if I put it up there, Ian, thank you. Um, then she said this a few years ago. Um, Although we are capable of great acts of kindness, history teaches us that sometimes we need saving from ourselves. Sometimes we do bad stuff from our recklessness or our greed. God sent into the world a unique person, neither a philosopher, in other words, a kind of a super clever teacher, nor a general, uh, i.e. somebody who's running an army, important though they are, but a savior with the power to forgive. Who is that savior that the queen is talking about? God sent into the world. Jesus, yeah. So the queen is reminding us she even knows that there's somebody even more powerful than her, that there's somebody even more important than her, that there's someone who's a wonderful savior, and that's Jesus. And she knows that she's not perfect, that we all need saving from ourselves, and that she needs the forgiveness of Jesus, as do all of us. And she also, as well, says that she wants to serve this God, because way before she actually uh, had her coronation. She asked for the country to pray for her. So this is way 70 years ago. She said, pray that God may give me wisdom and strength to carry out the solemn promises and that I may faithfully serve him and you all the days of my life. And that's the attitude of someone who's a Christian who wants to love and serve Jesus to say, I will serve him and I will serve everybody in his name. And so if Jesus is your savior and mine, then we want to serve him with our lives and serve other people by loving one another as he has loved us. Now, we're going to sing our praise to this Jesus. It's a song, praise him, praise him. But it also has the verse in it, serve him, serve him. Serve him in the playground, serve him in the classroom. So just as the queen realized that to serve Jesus, she does that in, if you like, her day job as queen. So you can do that in your day job as a pupil at school or in your sports or whatever you do every single day, you can serve him in the playground, in the classroom. So will we all stand and sing our praise to God? Praise him, praise him.
you continue to serve him as you go to promised land. So off you go. Stephen, and I hear a little bit from him and get to know him uh, a little bit better. Um, Stephen, we do a kind of thing here, TTT, what are you doing this time tomorrow? But to be honest with you, um, you're not at Union tomorrow, so that's not really much good to you, is it? Uh, but tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, obviously, wife, family, and uh, what you're up to. Brilliant, yeah, I'm Stephen. I am from Lisbon originally. Uh, moved to Ballyclare uh, six years ago uh, with my wife, Rachel. Uh, who teaches across the road, and with, we now have a two-and-a-half-year-old son called Judah, who you've probably heard already, and you'll see uh, probably a lot of uh, <laughs> over the next few years with his little tractor toys and digger toys and any sort of vehicle. So <laughs> United supporter, Man United uh, supporter. That um, was an essential criteria for anybody coming as yeah. an assistant minister to our congregation. Uh, <laughs> love a good coffee, and yeah, anything else? Tell us a little bit about Union. What does that involve for you? What stage are you at? Yeah, um, so Union Theological College, um, I love studying, uh, so <laughs> it was great to be back uh, at Union this year. So working on a three-year Master of Divinity uh, course, uh, there's 13 in, in the year, which is great. You had a guy uh, a few weeks ago, Stephen McCleary, with you, who did some joke where he warned you about how bad I was going to be. And <laughs> the joke's on him because he got sent to Sligo for the summer. So, uh, <laughs> um, no, Stephen's a great guy. Um, we have a really great year. Um, made some good friends. So just finished first year, um, starting the summer placement, and then back for, for second year in September to do some Greek and Hebrew. Okay, delightful. Don't remind me. Um, and so what did you do before all of that? going to Union to be a minister stuff. So what we involved yeah. in before that? Yeah, I, pr I probably should answer that in the first question. Um, so I worked in Railway Street Presbyterian in, in Lisbon for nearly seven years as a, a youth and family worker. Um, before that, I, I was studying um, a bit in Belfast Bible College. So uh, yeah, loved uh, the work there. I grew up in Lisbon. I grew up in Railway Street. I was a third generation Railway Streeter. So um, yeah, it was great. So whenever I was uh, studying, uh, I was employed as a youth and family worker and then just kept going at that. So that's what I did up until uh, last August. Okay, great stuff. And we we'll probably want to underline publicly that we're not sneaking Stephen in as a youth and family worker, worker in the Valley <laughs> Near. Uh, he is now a student assistant. So uh, you will have lots of other things uh, that you'll want to be getting involved in. So the next number of years, how does that pan out for you? What does this work? We're, we're calling you a student assistant. What does that look like? What should people expect? Will they see you all the time? Never? What happens? Yeah, um, so I uh, am on a bit of a, a different pathway than, than some of the other year. Um, because I had worked in real history and um, got a bit of experience there, uh, and because I had studied um, undergrad and postgrad stuff in, in theology, I'm on a bit of a different pathway, which means um, I'm placed here a year earlier than, um, than the rest of, of our year group. So what I think that means is uh, <laughs> I'm here full-time in the summer working with you. Um, uh, I'm working with with Ballinier, and then in September I'll still be coming here, uh, I'll still be working, but in a more kind of part-time capacity, and then uh, studying uh, during the um, term time, uh, and then next summer I'll be back to full-time here, and then final year I'll be back to part-time here and, and full-time studying, and then after that I'll be here full-time uh, for another year. So I'll be here with you for the next three years, um, in Various capacities, I suppose, yeah. Yeah, great, great stuff. Well, uh, we're delighted uh, to have you with us. Uh, we're delighted to have Rachel uh, and Judah uh, with us as well. Um, how could we pray for you as we kind of uh, welcome you in and, um, you know, think about the, the days ahead? What what do you want pray for, prayed for? Yeah, well, I was struck by the Queen's Prayer there, um, uh -huh. <laughs> that we that I'd serve him, um, the Lord, and also the Ballinier congregation faithfully. Um I suppose this is actually the first time I've ever moved church before. Uh, I grew up in Railway Street, um, so just that we as a family would, would settle in quickly. 
um, that we'd get to know people quickly. We're really excited to get to know everyone here. So just prayers that we'd, we'd settle in and, and prayers that we'd be a blessing to the mm. congregation uh, rather than a burden to you, James. <laughs> 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 but yeah, just that we'd be a blessing to the congregation in our time here and, and serve, um, serve God faith, faithfully, yeah. Yeah, excellent. Well, look, what we'll do is we will pray for uh, Stephen and his, his family just now uh, before Stephen uh, reads the scriptures too. So let's, let's pray together. Uh, our Lord and Father, we give you thanks for your hand upon our lives. Thank you for how you lead us and you guide us into lots of different situations and circumstances. And you, you call us to service in lots of different ways. Uh, but Lord, we thank you for your hand on Stephen's life and upon Rachel and Judah. And Lord, for calling Stephen into ministry. And Lord, for the opportunity he has uh, to serve amongst us for the next number of years. Lord, we're, we're delighted about that. And we, we pray for your blessing on him and Rachel and Judah. That they would really feel that they, they do settle in here. That they are very much part of our family of, of believers. That they are supported and encouraged and blessed. Lord, help them as they get to know us and, and, and us as we get to know them and that they'll feel very much at home here. We pray uh, for your help for Stephen as he begins his ministry and uh, gets involved in lots of different parts of our uh, congregational life. And uh, Lord, we pray that you will help him, indeed help all of us as we seek, Lord, to, to serve you and as we seek to serve uh, one another uh, faithfully uh, in the name of Jesus Christ. Uh, so pour out your Holy Spirit upon him, Lord. Uh, use him mightily uh, amongst us, even as he is here, essentially, we might say, as a student to learn, but Lord, he has so much to give. And so we pray uh, that you would open up all of our hearts, um, that we would learn and grow together in, in you, uh, and that you would bless uh, Stephen and use him as he serves in ministry here. Uh, we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So I'm going to hand over to Stephen. He's going to read uh, from Revelation 21 and the first wee bit of Revelation 22. So you, you can turn it up. It's page 1249. Uh, of the Bibles in your pews, and uh, I'll disappear and, and let Stephen read. Revelation 21, uh, verse 1 to Revelation 22, verse 5. A new heaven and a new earth. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. And then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Those who are victorious will inherit all this. And I will be their God, and they will be my children. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and the all liars, they will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of seven last plagues came and said to me, Come, I will show you the bride, the, la the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a mountain great and high and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. It shone with the glory of God and its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel, like jasper, clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with 12 gates and with 12 angels at the gates. On the gates were written the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. There were three gates on the east, three on the north, three on the south, and three on the west. The wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. The angel who talked with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city, its gates, and its walls. The city was laid out like a square as long as it was wide. He measured the city with the rod and found it to be 12,000 stadia in length, and as wide and high as it is long. 
The angel measured the wall using human measurement, and it was 144 cubits thick. The wall was made of jasper and the city of pure gold, as pure as glass. The foundations of the city walls were decorated with every kind of precious stone. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third agate, the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, the sixth ruby, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth turquoise, the eleventh jacinth, and the twelfth amethyst. The twelve gates were twelve pearls, each gate made with a single pearl. The great streets of the city was of gold, as pure as transparent glass. I did not see a temple in the city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light and the Lamb is its lamp. The nations will walk by its light and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. A new day will its gates ever be shut, for there will be no night there. The glory and honor of the nations will be brought into it. Nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. Each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. May the Lord bless his word to us. Thanks, Stephen. Uh, let's pray and ask God for his help as we learn together. Lord, our prayer is that the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts would be pleasing in your sight. That, Lord, you would give us ears to hear what your spirit says to the churches through your word. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, in her platinum jubilee message, uh, the queen, as she often does, struck a note of hope. Uh, I continue to be inspired by the goodwill shown to me and hope that the coming days will provide an opportunity to reflect on all that has been achieved during the last 70 years as we look to the future with confidence and enthusiasm. Now, we know, of course, that her hope, her sense of hope goes deeper than any nation's achievements. She looks to the future with confidence and enthusiasm because of a unique hope that she speaks of grounded in her Christian faith. So almost 30 years ago in her 1993 Christmas message, she said this, for all the inhumanity around us, let us be grateful for those who have received him or Jesus Christ and who go about quietly doing their work and his will without thought of reward or recognition. They know that there is an eternal truth of much greater significance than our own triumphs and tragedies. And it is embodied by the child in the manger. This was a Christmas address. That is their message of hope. Message of hope grounded in an eternal truth. In other words, we know how the story is going to end. And therefore, we have hope for now and hope forever. Now, you might say the queen sounds like an optimist. And actually, somebody commented on that last night. Oh, the queen's a great optimist. I wonder, are you an optimist like this, or are you a bit of a pessimist? Uh, oh, it's going to rain this afternoon, you know, James, you see that? Praise picnic in the park, there's no chance. Do you think things are going to turn out well, or do you tend to think that history is just going down the pan? Well, famous evangelist uh, Billy Graham, who preached for the Queen, who spent quite a bit of time with the Queen, 
is quoted as saying this, if I didn't have Christian faith, I would be a pessimist. But I'm an optimist. I've read the last page in the Bible. It's all going to turn out all right. Well, this morning, guess what we're doing? We've been reading the last pages of the Bible. And we're discovering it's all going to turn out all right. That hope does spring eternal. So if you've got Revelation 21 and 22 in front of you, it'd be good to glance at it as we probably take a bit of a helicopter kind of view of it. Uh, we're not digging down into too, many of the, too much of the detail, but we're trying to get you an overall picture of, of this passage. Chapters 21 and 22 come at the end of the big story of Revelation, but they come at the end of the big story of the whole of the Bible. And they are telling us how history is going to end and what lies after that. Or to put it another way, if you want to know what life after death is like, what heaven ultimately is like, then look here. And it's not what you might expect, incidentally. It's summed up in in verse 5 of chapter 21. I am making everything new. Everything is going to be made new. That's class. Everything is going to be made new. But there's probably a few areas of newness that we might want to think about this morning. The first is a new heaven and a new earth. You see it in verse 1, famously. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. Don't panic. It doesn't. This is, this is symbolic language, by the way. Okay? So, you know, how absolutely literal all of this will be when we eventually get there, we will discover. But this is symbolic language. No sea doesn't mean you can't go swimming in heaven, it means there's no chaos. Sea is the place of chaos and danger. There's no chaos in heaven. There's no danger in the new heavens and the new earth. Everything's going to be made new. But notice this. This is far more earthy than you might normally think or imagine. This is a new heaven and a new earth. This is an earthy thing. This is not a floaty spiritual existence on clouds playing harps. This is a new heaven and a new earth. It's solid. It is real. It's not ghostly. In his book, uh, The Great Divorce, C.S. Lewis imagines a group of people taking a bus to heaven. And he uses lots of imagination. But he speaks, uh, you know, from someone who's on this bus who gets out and starts to walk. And they say this, It was the light, the grass, the trees that were different made of some different substance, so much solider than things in our country that men were ghosts by comparison. So much, I'm sure the English people say it should be so much more solid, so much solider. (laughs) There's something very earthy about this new heaven and new earth. This is not about us escaping earth to go way up into heaven or to d- disappear off to some far side of the galaxy. This is heaven, notice, coming down to earth, the holy city coming down from heaven, from God to us. This is not us going up to dwell with God. This is God coming down to dwell with us. Look at verse 3. Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people. He will dwell with them. They will be his people. God will be with them and be their God. And it's not an endless church service, thankfully. It's life as it was created to be. Life in its absolute fullest with everything that is terrible taken away. Look at verse 4. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. We could list a whole lot of stuff, couldn't we? No more cancer, no more COVID, no more. For the old order of things has passed away. Verse 8 tells us there's no more sin, no more murder, everything horrendous and awful and evil is gone. The second death, hell, disappeared forever. There's a wee bit in Lord of the Rings where Gandalf comes back and Sam, one of the hobbits, is really excited about it all. It just all seems to be getting better. There's a new dawn, if you like, and Sam says to Gandalf, is everything sad going to come untrue? Yep. Is everything sad going to come untrue? Yes. Yes. It is. Hope springs eternal because we've got a new heaven and a new earth to look forward to. 
everything sad is going to come untrue in a very earthy kind of way. We're also introduced here to a new city. We're told in verse 2, it's the holy city, the new Jerusalem, uh, coming down out of heaven from God. We're, we're, we're told, in, for probably from about verse 9 of chapter 21 onwards to the end of the chapter, is, is a big, long description of this uh, holy city. You see verse 10, the Spirit showed me a holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. It's shown with the glory of God, and he goes on to uh, describe it. He goes on to describe a city that is more vibrant and more diverse than you could ever imagine. Heaven is going to be a community, a family, a vibrant and diverse community of nations. Did you see the Jubilee party last night? Maybe, maybe you did. Did you see all different people of different kinds from all across the globe representing the Commonwealth? People all gathering together in, in London to bring their thanks to the Queen. That's, that's just a tiny wee taster of what we're talking about here in this new city, this new heaven and new earth. The reference to Jerusalem simply means people of God. And the likes of verse 12, it talks about the 12 tribes of Israel, a way of representing the believers in the Old Testament. Verse 13 tells us about the gates in the east and the north and the south and the west. People from all across the world are going to come. Verse 13 talks, or verse 14, sorry, talks about the names of the 12 apostles. In other words, that's a representation of the believers in New Testament times and on up to these days, today, followers of Jesus Christ. And the vast measurements mentioned in the likes of verse 16, at 12,000 stadia is about from here to the uh, foot of Spain, I think roughly, uh, 1,400 miles, and then that's square, and then that's cubed. This is a massive thing, uh, th- th- probably not literal. This is saying there's room. There's plenty of room for all who follow Jesus into this extraordinary place. And all the descriptions of gold and glass and pearls and all those jewels. You can see why I gave someone else to do the reading instead of me to have to read those. All of that tells us how precious this city is. How valuable, how precious its people are. How glorious a place it is. Verse 22 and 23, the idea that the Lord is the temple. And that he is its lamp and light. In other words, this is where we will meet God face to face, like never before. And we will see his glory like never before. A new city with God at its center, Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, the one who has saved us, the one we are there to see. And verses 24, 25, 26 talk about nations coming in, kings of the earth bringing in their splendor, uh, gates they never need shut. Um, there's no danger. There's no night. You don't need security guards. The glory and honor of the nations will be brought in. Made me think again of last night and that Jubilee party. Because in that Jubilee party, you had lots of diverse cultures represented, lots of different styles of music. Uh, you had sports people. You had comedians. You, you had the incredible art, artistry that's involved in putting on a show like that with all its colors and diversity. Uh, you had fashion. Uh, you had people with different languages. You, you, you probably enjoyed lots of different types of food uh, in and around London as you had your tea before you headed up for, for the concert. It's splendor and glory of the nations being brought into one place to say thank you to the Queen of the Commonwealth. Well, how much greater will this new city be? How much more magnificent? How much more diverse? How much more vibrant is it going to be? the music and the dancing and the art, the fashion and the food and the sports and who knows what else brought into the beauty of the new heaven and the new earth. He is making everything new. And just as much as anybody intent on any harm or crime yesterday in London would have been kept out of the Jubilee celebrations by security, so we're told nothing impure is ever going to enter this city nor anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. They are in this kingdom, and that's why they're there, brought in by the Lamb. Hope springs eternal because of this incredible, vibrant city that you and I can look forward to. And this this whole picture that we've got so far, and other parts of Revelation are kind of saying a little bit more as well, because you probably noted 
that in verse 2, when it mentioned the city, it also said it was a prepared as a bride. And then in verse 9, come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. So the new city is kind of a bride at the same time. This is the way Revelation works. It mixes all these symbols together and pictures together. What is it saying? Heaven is like a wedding party. It's like a wedding party. Now, I don't know of a better party than a wedding party. I've been to lots of parties, but no parties are better than a wedding party. And the church, God's people, the followers of Jesus are a bride beautifully dressed, the wife of the lamb, the lamb is Jesus. What do you get at a wedding? You get more love and more joy than you could ever imagine. And that's what this picture is about. Maybe some of us, maybe guys in particular, find the kind of bride of the lamb thing a bit of a weird picture. It's getting across to you and me the closeness that he wants with you and me and the, the nature of the love he has for you and me. The, the kind of relationship he wants you and I to enjoy with him now, but ultimately in heaven forever. You and I are more loved, more deeply loved by Jesus Christ than you and I could ever get our heads or hearts around right now. And he longs to spend eternity with you and me and to pour his love into you and me for the rest of all time and eternity. In heaven, you will know a torrent of love and joy, the like of which you and I have only tasted a drop of here on earth. It's a wedding party. And you will see Jesus face to face, and you will know his great love, that you're his beloved people. It's a new heaven and a new earth. It's very earthy. There's something here and solid about it. It's an incredible, diverse community of people, this new city. And we're going to see Jesus and be loved by him. And finally, it's a new garden as well. See, chapter 22, the first few verses that Stephen read for us. The city is also like a garden. It starts by talking about a city, then it starts talking about the water of life, and then we've got a tree of life in verse 2, bearing fruit, yielding its fruit every month, bringing the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. Hmm. Does any of that look familiar? Does any of it sound familiar? We have gone in six months from the beginning of the Bible to the very end. Can you remember the beginning? Where did it begin? In a garden. With a tree. With life and joy. And then it got messed up. And there was a terrible curse. You know what God sent to us through this book of Revelation, through this picture of the new heaven and new earth? He says, I'm going back to the start, but it's going to be better than ever before. I'm going to restore it back to the way it was at Eden, but better. And this tree of life is going to give fullness of life to all. All hurts and divisions are going to be mended and healed. The curse is going to go. No more sinful weeds in the garden. No more satanic snake to mess it up. It's paradise forever and ever. It's more peace and harmony than you could ever imagine. A peaceful home, garden, for you to settle down in. For you to be the people that you were made to be in. That's what that line at the end is, and they will reign forever and ever. Weren't we called as human beings to rule over God's creation with his good ways? Well, that's what's going to happen at the end of time. Hope springs eternal because you are going to get to settle down in peace and harmony in a place just like that. Wow. New heaven and a new earth, a new city, a wedding party beautiful new garden. There's more to heaven than you thought, isn't there? There's more to the end of time than you thought. There's more joy in it, more peace, more love than you probably thought. What difference does it make to the here and now, you might say? You've maybe heard people say, oh, you're so heavenly minded, you have no your earthly use. Well, that's not Bible truth. C.S. Lewis would say that the people who make most impact on this earth are those who have greatest thoughts about heaven. 
So I guess the first question is, is that how your story's gonna end? Because the key to knowing that your story's gonna end there is probably verse 27 of, of, of chapter 21, is your name written in the Lamb's book of life. Not because you or I are sinless and perfect, not at all. But because our sin and everything that would mess up this beautiful place has been taken from us and dealt with by Jesus at the cross. That's why he's called the lamb, because he gives his life for us. He sheds his blood for us so that we are forgiven. Our sin is taken away and we have life eternal with him. So have you gone to him with that? Go to him and say, look, Jesus, I, I, I see here in verse 6 that you're the Alpha and the Omega, that you say to the thirsty, I'll give water without cost and spring the water of life. Well, I am thirsty. I'm thirsty for you. I'm thirsty for forgiveness. I'm thirsty for you to give me this life. I don't even know half of what this means, but I know I just want to be a Christian. I want to be a follower of Jesus, of the Lamb who wins in the end. So I, I, I just want to follow him. Lord, please help me. See this line about being victorious and inheriting all of this. I don't deserve to inherit it all, Lord. I want you to be my God. I want to be one of your children. Please come into my life. I don't want to be one of the people in verse 8 that gets chucked out into the second death of hell. I don't want that. No, Lord Jesus, I want to be one of your people. Just come to him and tell him that or something like it. Remember that invitation away back in chapter 3, verse 20? Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, he will come in and eat with him and he with me. So just say, Lord, I'm opening the door. I'm opening the door. But also, the difference this makes for you and I, for many, because we are followers of the Lamb, we are on his team, we are in his army, we are going with him to this place, is that that perspective that the Queen gave in her very first quote is, is, is true for us, that, that we go about his work and will without thought of reward or recognition because we know the eternal hope. We know it's worth it. We know that what we do now counts for eternity. Nothing you do for him is a waste of time or effort. And so you say to the Lord, I'm here to serve you. And you look out into the world around you and say, I'm here to serve you. Not for myself, but for the glory of Jesus the Lamb. And don't want, we want to bring little tasters of this heaven to earth now that might be caring for creation, that might be making sure that we live without prejudice and discrimination because we're going to be part of a multi-ethnic, multi-national community in heaven, aren't we? That might mean we're serving our neighbors. That might mean that we as a congregation are growing as a loving, vibrant community because guess what? We're going to spend eternity together, so we better start practicing. That might say, well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be less ashamed to tell people about Jesus because look where the story ends. And I want people there with me. That will mean having a heart for Jesus in the heart of this community. That will mean that you and I can face the future with confidence no matter what the news tells us because that will go up and down. But we know how the story ends. And even if the worst should come to us, we can still face death with hope because this is where you go. This is where you go. And it's a magnificent place. It's better than what we've already experienced by far. So place your hope in the one who gives hope that springs eternal. C.S. Lewis has his own unique way of helping us think about all that lies ahead. At the very end of Narnia, when Aslan appears, he says this, the term is over, the holidays have begun, very nearly. The dream is ended, this is the morning. And as he spoke, he no longer looked to them like a lion. But the things that began to happen after that were so great and beautiful, I cannot write them. And for us, this is the end of all stories. And we can most truly say they all lived happily ever after. But for them, it was only the beginning of the real story. 
All their life in this world and all their adventures in Narnia had only been the cover and the title page. Now at last they were beginning chapter one of the great story, which no one on earth has read, which goes on forever, in which every chapter is better than the one before. That's what Revelation says. That's what lies ahead. That's how the story ends and keeps on going. We're going to celebrate that together. We're going to celebrate it in this brilliant uh, hymn of praise, There is a Higher Throne, and then we're going to celebrate it together around the Lord's table. Uh, will you stand? Let's sing our praise to God. There is a higher throne. <laughs> This is the table of the Lamb. This is the table of the Lord Jesus Christ. You are welcome as we gather here. It is open to all whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life, not because we have some kind of presumption, but because of Jesus and his wonderful grace that all who trust in him have their robes washed white in the blood of the Lamb we hear the words of Revelation. 
the spirit and the bride say, come. And the one who hears say, come. Let the one who is thirsty come. And the one who wishes to take the free gift of the water of life come. If in all honesty, you know uh, that you are not to be taking uh, communion today. You don't yet trust in Jesus. That's just let uh, communion uh, sit there and you use this time to reflect upon Jesus Christ and all he has done for you in the picture of heaven we have painted uh, today. We come before God in prayer. Let's all pray. Lord Jesus, we praise you for this wonderful invitation to come to your table, to this table of communion, this place of meeting with you that is a little taster of the wedding party that heaven will be one day. We thank you that as we gather together as a people around this table, that in itself is a little reminder, a little taster of how one day we'll be a new city, a community following Jesus together in heaven. Lord, give us that taster, we pray, Lord Jesus. We are thirsty for you. We're thirsty to meet with you, to know your presence, your love, your joy, your peace. Oh, Lord, your grace. Lord, we need your grace because, Lord, none of us would put our names in the Lamb's Book of Life. Lord, we, we hear those lists of things that you want to keep out of heaven. Lord, well, that's us. So, Lord, forgive us our sin. Cleanse us from all that's wrong in our lives. And, Lord, forgive us because, you know, we don't think about heaven enough. We don't think about where we're going enough. We don't think about the end of the story enough. And so, Lord, so often, uh, you know, we lose hope then day by day because our eyes aren't on you. Our eyes aren't on eternity. And, Lord, we, we, we grow weary. We lose heart because we don't realize that what we do for you matters in eternity. Lord, cleanse us from all that's wrong. Reassure us, we pray. And by your spirit, help us as we uh, take these little elements of, of bread and wine we pray that as we take them into our bodies, that we would be taking more and more of the life of Jesus Christ into our very souls. So may that be by the power of your spirit, we pray. Amen. Amen. The Apostle Paul uh, tells us, um, for what I received from the Lord, I also passed on to you. The night he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so, you might remember, there's two little lids on this. The one that's see-through gives you the top one. And that allows you to open it to your little piece of bread. This is the body of Christ, which is given for you. Take and eat it in remembrance of him.
little foil lid uh, lets you open your wine and you remember that this is the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ which is shed for you. Take it and drink all of it in remembrance of him. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we praise you that you, your body was broken and your blood was shed so that we could have a place in the new heaven and the new earth, the new city, the new garden at the wedding party so that we would see you, Lord Jesus, face to face, so that we would be in that place of love and joy and peace forever. And we thank you that it is earthy, that it is physical, however we can get our heads around it. So Lord, help us in our physical bodies to live out the reality of that heaven that's ahead of us. Lord, we want to be of earthly use to you. Lord, we've prayed your kingdom come. And Lord, so often as we rely on you and your spirit works in us, then we become the answer to that prayer as you work through us to bring your kingdom. Lord, we just think before you of the one or two places in our own lives where we need your help to live with hope. We need your help to live with confidence. We need your help, Lord, to serve you and to serve those around us. So fill us and enable us, we pray. Lord, in particular, we pray for those who do not yet consider themselves on the side of the Lamb of God. And we pray, Lord, they might be family members, friends, people in our community. Oh, Lord, give us, give us the confidence, the courage, the sensitivity, the gentleness, the wisdom to share something of you, Lord Jesus, with them. In fact, Lord, may they get tasters of heaven through how we live. So much so that they, they want more so much so that they thirst for you, Jesus, the water of life. Lord, move in us, we pray. Help us to be that congregation of people who have a heart for you, Jesus, in the heart of this community. Take us and use us, each one, this week. Lord, you've told us you've left your spirit on earth until the work here on earth is done. So may we be about your work this week in the power of your spirit. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing praise is there as a redeemer. Uh, Jesus, God's own son, describes him over a couple of verses and then it takes us, when I stand in glory, I will see his face and there I'll serve my king forever in that holy place. And in the meantime, he gives us his spirit until the work on earth is done. Let's stand together and give ourselves in praise and worship and service to him.
benediction I'd like you uh, to join in. You'll see the words uh, on the screen. I'll say a little bit in white. Uh, these are the very last words of the book of Revelation, and you can all join in uh, the little yellow bits. He who testifies of these things says, yes, I'm coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with God's people. Amen. Amen indeed. Uh, thank you for joining with us for this service. Thank you uh, to our musicians for leading us and the tech guys looking after us and our welcome team uh, as well and our Promised Land team. Really do appreciate uh, everyone and their service and helping us uh, today. Uh, every blessing. And Stephen and I will meet you at the door for a hello. Mm -hmm.